So the uh, it's a minute past eleven, so we're <laughs> quite on time, uh, on, as it were. Um, just to say a few words, uh, welcome to you all uh, on this our first um, event in this um, IUCS Conversation Days um, series of of events and, and d discussions. Um, I'm Father Dragos. I'm the principal of the um, Institute now, and um, um, I'll just try to spend less than five minutes um, saying something about these days, then introduce um, Elizabeth. Um, again, welcome, a very warm welcome to Rebecca. Um, Rebecca Watson, she is a research associate for the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion. And um, if you don't already uh, know this, Elizabeth is um, our own research associate at, at IOCS. Um, one of the first things I would like to say is to say how wonderful it is that we're having this event here at, at Wesley House. The Institute has recently moved um, at Wesley House here and uh, we're delighted that we're back here in the city centre, back with um, our colleagues in the Federation, uh, back in the mix of things. Uh, we've already seen the fruits of this uh, literal um, closeness. Uh, we're meeting people, we're talking to people, students. Um, we feel very much that we are making things happen. This is a, a wonderful thing. Um, we're reconnecting in a way, whether we've ever been disconnected with, with our um, roots um, and, and membership in the Cambridge Theological Federation, which is this wonderful, um, sometimes strange, um, um, partnership of, of various um, colleges from different um, Christian traditions. Now the topic of today's event is Working Salvation in the Midst of the Earth, Ecology and Christian Tradition. And it's relevant that we are starting off these conversation days on such a, an important topic. Uh, and it's, it's something that is painfully um, relevant. It's a painfully relevant topic these days uh, as we become m ever more aware of the impact that we have on the planet and if we are to speak theologically, the impact that we have on, the, on our relationship with God's creation. So the title of today's event, I think, puts into a sharp perspective what we as Christians cannot and should not separate, um, which is that our salvation, our destiny, from that of the world where we have been placed as um, stewards by God. These conversation days at IOX are intended as a short series of um, free, um, uh, open to all uh, pu public talks and conversations on relevant topics for people of faith today. And as I said, um, since these are envisaged as conversations, the format is to have two speakers for each occasion, uh, preferably from different Christian traditions or research backgrounds, uh, which would um, deliver a presentation in turn. Um, there will be time for the speakers to respond to another and then for you to um, ask questions. Um, the reason why we thought of this format is because I think the best conversations, uh, the best dialogue occurs when there's enough common ground but equally space for plural and the new perspectives. <coughs> and this enables learning and the discovery of our neighbor's life in Christ to which we would otherwise be ignorant, or indeed expo exposes us to ideas and perspectives that would elude us um, otherwise. Now a few words about Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth is both a long-standing friend and supporter of the Institute, and has frequently lectured for us since um, the Institute's inception almost 20 years ago. And among her various roles across her career, she um, was a visiting Orthodox tutor at the Ecumenical Institute in Bosse in Switzerland. Um, she also lectured on liturgical theology at Holy Cross Orthodox School of Theology in, in Brooklyn, Massachusetts in the US, and has served as General Secretary of the Fellowship of St. Alban and St. Sergius, just to name a few of her roles. Um, she also co-edited uh, the Cambridge Companion to Orthodox Christian Theology, authored the, um, a book called Living in God's Creation, Orthodox Perspectives on Ecology, uh, with St. Vladimir Seminary Press. She has written numerous articles and books, uh, book chapters on orthodoxy and ecology and liturgical um, theology. More recently, um, she has been um, involved with the Institute um, as a 
one of the founding chairs of the Friends of IOCS, uh, uh, particularly the UK branch. Um, the Friends of IOX is, uh, is a rather a new um, initiative uh, which aims to bring together the community of IOCS supporters wor worldwide, people who, are, um, who love the Institute, who are interested in, in supporting the Institute, either because they've been um, alumni or uh, have been involved with the Institute in the past. So this is really um, more of an outreach um, initiative. Even more recently, Elizabeth has been involved um, with both our online certificate um, by distance learning, uh, where she's preparing a module on creation and eschatology, and also on the postgraduate um, MA program, where she is also preparing a, um, a module um, on Christian tradition and ecology. The titles won't necessarily stay the same, but this is by and large um, um, what, what Elizabeth is working on. Um, now her expertise in the field of theological ecology goes back almost 30 years and we are absolutely delighted to have her with us today together with Rebecca and to, um, to start off this series of conversation days. So a warm welcome again and the floor is to you. Thank you. If you don't mind I will sit because it's I hope easier to control the technology. Um, from this position, so... There's a remote control, if you want to say. Uh, I, I, I'm happier with this or with the machine. <laughs> but, um, yes, the, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this works. I, I realise the, the title we chose, Working Salvation in the Midst of the Earth, could sound a bit like the latest green program from the World Council of Churches or someone, except that, of course, as we know, it's, this isn't something that humans are doing. This is something that God has done. It's a quotation from Psalm 73, Septuagint 12, uh, our God is king forever, working salvation in the midst of the earth. And that, of course, refers to the cross. This to start with is, is extremely important. This is what God's kingship consists of, being crucified. And Golgotha traditionally is the middle of the earth so that the skull, the place of the skull, the skull is identified with Adam's skull. It's, it's an example of everything coming together, creation and salvation. So in the middle of the earth with the cross, you have a tree. And similarly, in the middle of paradise, there was a tree. And in the middle of Lent, there is a tree. We have the veneration of the cross right in the middle of Lent. And, and central to much ecological thinking, of course, is the saving, the many saving roles of trees, whether it's storing carbon, stabilizing the soil, making a difference, turning what is potentially the water of death in flooding into life-giving irrigation. That, of course, gives a very interesting parallel with the symbolism of the cross and the symbolism of, of baptism, blessing the waters. And these parallels are absolutely not coincidental and they're not something merely decorative. If you like, they are the signature of the same author they remind us that the creation of the universe and the saving work of God in the incarnation are part and parcel of the, this, this same great movement of the divine economy. And this idea of recurring patterns is very, very ancient. Uh, goes back at least to St. Irenaeus, who of course is making precisely this point against Gnostics who held that there were actually two divinities involved, uh, the, a, a creator and a savior, different entities. So he refers to this, this sort of parallel to show that our physical earthly life and our eternal life come from precisely the same source. And in both, God shows this signature way of working through matter, through the whole creation. So material creation is an integral part of our spiritual life. And that's the main point I want to make. You, you, know, you, you may say when I've finished, this doesn't have much to do with the specifics of ecology, 
But what I believe is that if we take this seriously, it shapes our entire vision of the world we live in and how we live. And it's interesting that the increased environmental awareness over principally over the half, last half century has led many people to try and identify, you know, what is it in people's beliefs and outlook that might underlie abuse of the natural world? And of course, in the process, people have come up with ideas that are quite simplistic. But I think it makes sense to suggest that it's got something to do with a separation between what we call the natural world and ultimate value, a devaluing of what we might call mere matter compared with the spiritual, spiritual world, spiritual life. Now, how do you bridge that gap? Well, one characteristic modern way of trying to bridge it is manifested in a, a fear of being too spiritual, too otherworldly. You know, one sees this sometimes also in Christianity today. So in this case, it's ultimate value that is shifted, as it were, more towards the material world as we know it. C talking about creation-centered spirituality as an example of this. The typical orthodox reaction which is based on the integrated and integral worldview traditional to Christianity, by this yardstick, it's the modern understanding of the material world that needs to shift. The idea that matter, which is given being by God, can be mere anything. There's this extraordinary passage in one of Metropolitan Anthony's talk that some, you, some of you may know, that he speaks that there's not an atom in this world that doesn't hold in its core the thrill of its coming into being, of its possessing infinite possibilities and entering into the divine realm so that it knows God and rejoices in him. So in this view, it's not a matter of restricting human horizons to this world, but of broadening the horizons of the world, the material world, into eternity. So strictly speaking, one can't really have a creation-centered spirituality because creation itself isn't creation-centered. We are all creatures formed ultimately from nothing. This is something that St. Maximus talks about as a, a common factor. That means that our very de being depends totally on God's loving creative will. And the shared destination of creaturehood is indeed to enter into the divine work realm. It's not that humans are simply moving through a world which is permanently corruptible. We are creatures at once material and spiritual, and so we're to take with us the rest of the material world into resurrection, into transfiguration. In some way, absolutely beyond our comprehension, this involves matter being suffused with the spirit, like, indeed, the body of the risen Christ. So what I want to do in the rest of this talk is to look in a bit more detail at how this vision emerges from doctrine and worship, uh, including the icon, and from what we see in holy lives. So to talk first about doctrine, the point I've just been trying to make about creaturehood is unequivocally expressed in the first article of the creed. We believe in the creator of all things visible and invisible. And note, that is the definition of creation. Creation is not a pious synonym for nature in the sense of the non-human world. It can, of course, be endlessly debated whether man is part of nature, but you can't really debate whether man is part of creation perfectly obvious, we are part of all things visible and invisible. So the basic question isn't even about how man relates to other creatures. I mean, that's a question, but it's a secondary one. The basic question, and you know, the, in that case, God is a sort of celestial referee for good behavior. But the basic question is about God's purposes for his entire creation and the role that he's appointed the human to play 
in the unfolding of those universal purposes. One of the most fruitful ways of speaking about the connection between creatures and God and among creatures is the idea developed most fully by St. Maximus, that of the logi, the words of all things. The logos of a thing being, it's not only impossible to translate, it's also very difficult to define. But one can think of it as an inner principle which determines the nature of the entity itself and at the same time echoes in a unique way the creator word, logos, through whom and for whom all things are made. So Maximus can talk about the word of God being embodied in the words of things. Maximus actually says, strictly speaking, God is everything, which doesn't mean that everything is God. It means that God is the only one who, strictly speaking, is. He is he who is. Therefore, by virtue of being, everything participates in him. So God's embodied in the words of things, just as he is in the words of scripture. And this embodiment is the pattern that is fulfilled, of course, when the word becomes literally and personally embodied as the son of the virgin. Moment of truth, does this work? So the incarnation is seen as taking forward the purpose of creation the word takes up what's material and mortal and transfers, transforms it into what he is with this remarkable result. What is mortal has been saved by the flesh of God. When I first heard that in church in, in English, I actually went back to check the Greek. Is that exactly what it says, that starkly? And it is. It's the actual matter, the flesh that the God the word has made his own becomes the means of salvation. So it's little wonder that John of Damascus can say, never will I cease honoring the matter which wrought my salvation, talking about the icon, but there are other ways too in which we honor matter. And the cosmic effect of the divine embodiment starts to become clear if we reflect on what this human body is that God has taken to himself. And Olivier Clément has a very remarkable uh, statement about this, talking about the, the form imprinted by our living soul on the universal dust. So no discontinuity between the flesh of the world and human flesh. The universe is the body of humanity. And that, of course, is something that many people say from a scientific point of view. So that this continuity that Clément talks about, the porous boundaries, we could say, between creatures on the physical level, absolutely doesn't mean that there's no differentiation between creatures. You know, it could, it could be taken to mean, oh, well, we're just, you know, we're all handfuls of chemicals and slightly different handfuls. And that, that's certainly not what Clément or any orthodox is saying. But it does mean that no creature is an island, or to use the scriptural image, creatures function like members of the body. Again, that image St. Paul is using of the church. But the church is ref the pattern in the church is reflected in the created order. We don't only live in a human community, we live in an ecological community, a community of creatures in which pretty much everything affects everything else. As St. Ephraim says, our need for everything binds us with a love for everything. And uh, he is probably thinking more of domestic animals, but it, obviously it goes far beyond that. You know, if we think for a moment the, the bees who pollinate our crops or the earthworms and microorganisms who make the soil or the reefs that nurture the fish that we then eat. You know, the whole universe is set up in such a way that it's very hard to say of any creature, I have no need of you. So the church's theological vision enables us to agree with that familiar environmental theme that man needs nature 
but some environmentalists would go on to say nature doesn't need man, and that, of course, is a different matter. If you take a very limited, uh, as low view of the destiny of material creation, of course it's perfectly correct. If humans vanish from the face of the earth, then the other species would rearrange themselves and life would go on until something else drove it to extinction. But the question is, is, is this what we believe God created all this intricate beauty for? just for an endless cycle of birth and death and decay. Methodius of Olympus on the resurrection says God is a good craftsman, and his idea of a good craftsman is one who doesn't believe in built-in obsolescence. And other fathers point this out too. The material world is to be changed, not to be obliterated, and they take that to mean to be transformed into Christ. And this can be accomplished through that creature in whom the spiritual and the material are united, which is man. As Gregory of Nyssa says, man is compounded of spiritual and matter so that nothing is rejected as worthless, so that one grace can pervade all creation. So we believe that nature does need man because man is appointed as the creature through whom creation is united to God. St. Maximus talks about the workshop of unity and our task in creation, therefore, is to grow into Christ and as we do so, we take with us the whole of the material world so that ultimately, in and through us, the creator resides proportionately in all things through human nature. Turning now to worship, worship, you know, orthodox worship particularly, takes us into a very different world from that of the secular society in which we live our daily lives, uh, at risk, always a risk of oversimplifying, but to a large extent we live our daily lives in a world of amenities and commodities and resources. You know, very often that's how we see the world around us. And of course, use of the world isn't necessarily destructive, but the point is we, we see humans as the final arbiters of how the world should be used. When we come to church, of course, we don't stop using the natural world, anything but. It's present, it's in the, the stone and wood and the plaster of church buildings, it's in the water for baptism, it's interesting, that's the only element used sacramentally in its natural state, not worked at all by man. But matter is in the bread and the wine and the oil and wax and charcoal and so forth. But these things aren't simply neutral until we use them sacramentally. There's a wonderful phrase again from Olivier Clément saying that we release prayer from things the prayer is in some sense already there, where acting in accord with their decent nature, their deepest nature. And uh, Schmemann talks about this, saying that, that consecration doesn't create a separate category of sacred objects. It refers objects to their own real deepest meaning, God's conception of them. And this original and ultimate meaning isn't just for our bodily needs, although, of course, it's that too, but it's to point to God and to point us to God. The necessities of life, all these elements, water and so forth, point us to the one who is life himself. So that's what John of Damascus means when he refers to the, the command uh, in Genesis about the tree they shall eat of, or rather trees, you know, every tree, and he says this means from every tree you should be harvesting the fruit of knowledge of God. The paradigm for how we use the world. 
And when we listen to the words of the services going beyond the actions, we discover that this sacramental function of matter is part of, again, much broader pattern. It isn't just matter used in church that points us to God. Creation itself responds to its Lord, rejoices in him, as Bishop Anthony says, and often it's ahead of us, the, uh, the Christmas Traparian gives us a classic example of this, the Christmas star is leading to Christ, humans who are trying to worship it, and the star is saying, no, no, it's not me, it's him. Um, you know, the, he is the true son of righteousness, and we have, as in the Gospels, the, the sun and earth mourn at the crucifixion, all things suffer with the creation of all. And every breath praises the Lord at the end of Matins, and this is a sort of, can be seen as a preparation for the human offering of praise, which is the Eucharist, and you know, one could go on and on. Again, we might be inclined to think of texts such as these as you know, beautiful, inspiring, but poetry. But this, I think, is a mistake. I think that the liturgical texts actually tell us something essential about the, the real material world we live in, but they're talking about it on a level that we don't normally see, and certainly a, a level that is not accessible to scientific observation. And on this level, the world is populated not just with objects and certainly not with commodities to serve our needs, but with creatures that are God's servants, as we say in the anaphora of St. Basil. The essential task of all the created beings around us is something that can best be translated into human terms as praising the Lord. So that suggests that the psalmist means exactly what he says when he speaks of the heavens declaring the glory of God. And uh, Gregory of Nyssa actually suggests that when David wrote this, he was describing the celestial hymnody that he'd heard. And why not? This has been the experience of many holy people through the ages. Of course, it's a minority who perceive the world directly in this way as a locus of liturgy, but the liturgical texts, starting with the Psalms, are putting this on record as an objective reality. So we take our place, in, uh, our proper place in that world by making our own sacrifice of praise, our thanksgiving Eucharist in all things and for all things. And hence, of course, the importance of the Eucharist in Orthodox ecological thinking. Uh, Eucharistic ethos is a phrase that's often used, the idea that all our use of the world should be an offering in the spirit of gratitude, thanksgiving, and very importantly, a recognition that we have nothing and can use and offer nothing that isn't already God's own. And this is all very true, but one caveat is to remember that the world we live in isn't only the matter of a cosmic Eucharist, it's also a conciliation. And the, and the Athenite Archimandrite Vasilios of Egeron talks about this, saying that anyone who has entered into the liturgy has experienced the words, the logi of existing things, concelebrating with the one incarnate word. This is, it's, it's based, I think, on something that Maximus says about the transfiguration, when Christ is transfigured, the, the words of all existent things appear with him. What does this mean for daily life? Well, first of all, again, it doesn't mean that everything's on the same level as humans. You know, St. Nectarius heard the grasses praising God. That doesn't mean that we're murderers when we mow the lawn. But what it does mean is that we think very carefully about how we use anything. Is the way I'm treating this plant or animal or landscape or mineral, is it in accord with the ministry to God 
for which that thing was created. Now, if we're using the world to serve the real needs of our neighbor or of other creatures, the answer may well be yes, even if something is destroyed in the process. If we're just using things wastefully or throwing them away with no thought of what will eventually become of them, then it probably isn't. There's a remarkable precept in the rule of St. Benedict uh, that elides this essentially artificial distinction between liturgical and everyday treatments of matter, look upon all the property of the monastery as if it's sacred or altar vessels. And another contemporary Athenite says something very similar, do every task as if you were standing at the altar preparing for Holy Communion. So this brings us back to the Eucharist. And an another point not so often stressed that I want to say something about is the Eucharist is a meal. Now, it goes without saying that eating is probably our most basic interaction with our environment and the most literal way in which we make the world our own. We make the world into ourselves. On the other hand, many Christians probably have misgivings about the way in which eating in the form of consumption has become the dominant metaphor for our relationship with everything around us, even the services offered by other humans. Again, this seems to reduce the world and human labor to resources. And yes, being consumers brings us into some sort of relationship with producers, if not with the things produced. But even here, it's not necessarily a need for each other that inspires love for each other. The, the consumer mentality basically is about getting what I want from the world and from other people. What does this have to do with the Eucharist? Well, there's a similarity in this mentality, I think, the consumer mentality to the behavior that St. Paul is complaining about to the Corinthians. Everyone goes ahead with their own meal. Do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? Why is St. Paul so outraged? Well, perhaps because this is such a total travesty of what the Eucharist is meant to be. Yes, the Eucharist is a meal. We've taken up resources from the earth. We've turned them into human food. And yet... It's an event of eating that's the antithesis of consumption as we usually think about it. it. It operates in the opposite way. To consume the world's goods, whether literally or figuratively, is to turn them into an extension of me. In the Eucharist, we bring human food stuffs to the table, with a capital T, the holy table, in order for Christ to turn them into himself. And he being eaten, never is consumed, but sanctifies those who partake. The words are important. When we eat the Eucharistic supper, we're not consuming, we're partaking, taking part in a mystic food which is always greater than ourselves. He doesn't become an extension of us. We become an extension of him. In more conventional terms, a member, a part of his body. So by reversing this relationship of consumption, the Eucharist really revolutionizes our relationship with the rest of creation. And of course, we continue to take up creation and shape it. That's our nature. But our vision is no longer one of subsuming it into ourselves, but bringing it into the body of Christ. The same applies to the human community with whom we share in the one bread. I'm always very glad when the liturgy of St. Basil is celebrated and the Anaphora prayers are audible because then we actually hear the purpose of the descent of the Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts. Unite all of us who partake of the one bread and one cup, one to another in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Consumption can divide. Partaking in the one who holds all things in unity unites us with other people and other creatures. And this is the witness of the Eucharist. Again, St. Maximus 
uh, it's a wonderful passage in the Mystagogy, which is well worth reading about the, the Eucharist as a sacrament of unity. Things belong to each other rather than to themselves. Coming on now to the icon, another very obvious example of shaping the world. When we shape the world in our everyday life, uh, the way we apply our creativity and particularly our technical skill and technology, this is a crucial issue in consideration of environmental problems. How far is technology the problem, how far can it be the solution, and what sort of yardstick can we apply to distinguish between appropriate technologies and counterproductive ones. Theologians sometimes emphasize the need for a contemplative approach to the world. It's been summarized as don't just do something, stand there. And it's certainly important to realize that we need to be receptive, that we need to learn from the natural world on a spiritual as well as a technical level. Again, one could say a lot more about that. But using the world is an integral part of the sort of creature we are. So it's vital that our use of the world isn't seen as opposed to contemplation. Using the world, too, has to be a, a way of discerning God's wisdom and decoding his words inscribed in all created things. Uh, this is something that Father Demetrius Danuai writes a lot about, the, the words in things being also words addressed to us. What does this have to do with the icon? Well, the icon, one can say, challenges our pessimism about human technology and also our inclination to idolize the natural because making an icon is anything but a natural use of materials. You know, wood naturally belongs in trees, minerals belong in the earth, uh, eggs are made to produce chickens and not to bind pigments. And humans' technical skill is brought to bear on these materials to shape them into an image of Christ, or if it's a saint, an image of an image of Christ. And yet, one can say that this use of materials, which in one way is quite contrary to their nature, but it's not arbitrary or distorting because the creation has filled his, uh, the creator has filled his creation with figures, images of himself, things that point to him and reveal him. So when we turn a part of that creation into a literal icon of Jesus Christ incarnate, we're actually bringing out something that accords with its deepest being. So when we turn back from the icon to the natural world, we can recall that the rock with, was Christ, or that a tree has become his footstool, which we venerate for it, for it is holy. This is part of the deepest purpose of things, which are created to echo the word through whom they are created. And our technical skills can serve to fulfill this potential in new ways. This could involve creating a beauty different from that in nature. It could also involve shaping and harnessing nature in ways that make it a clear manifestation of God's mercy and providential care. Either way, we're acting in and on the natural world out of a vision of its relationship to God. And the vision of the world's relationship to God is something we see time again and again in holy lives, whether older lives of the saints or in modern holy people that many of us will have been privileged to encounter. There's an Athenite saying that one who loves God loves not only his fellow man but the entire creation as well, loves everything with the same love. And uh, Elder Porphyrios, who I'm sure you've heard of, is a good example of that talking about delighting in all things around us. And these are the, the little loves through which we attain to the great love that is Christ. To attain holiness is, after all, to 
grow into the likeness of the new Adam. And so the world around the holy person takes on aspects of paradise, a place where every tree provides a fruit, which is a relationship with God. Or another contemporary elder, Paisios, once told some visitors, this grass is an icon, it's full of the energies of God, I can kiss it and venerate it. And uh, a friend of ours asked him for something to remember him by, and uh, Elder Paisios gave him a leaf, the leaf and gave it to him. I want to return to the idea of loving everything with the same love, because the balance of this saying, I think, is so important, and captures the ethos of holiness, because it really strikes at the root of one of the objections often raised with varying degrees of honesty, I'd say, against environmental endeavours, that, oh, you're putting the interests of humans secondary to that of whales or cod or whatever it is. And there's no doubt that it's sometimes very tempting to love nature and see humans as the problem. But this is not the way of the saints. You know, you think of St. Seraphim who fed the bear that visited him and also, you know, greeted every visitor that, he, that came to him. Uh, he would greet, you know, Christ is risen, my joy. Or St. Siloan the Athenite, whose compa compassion extends equally to the enemies and persecutors of the church and to the weeds overhanging the path. Well, one might say that's all very nice, but what when there really are conflicts of interest between humans and other creatures? And what we see, again, there are instances in lives of the saints, if there is a real and insoluble con conflict, then legitimate human needs do take preference, but the emphasis is on needs. Uh, there's a story from the desert of Sinai of a hermit who was approached by some Saracen tribesmen who had nothing to eat. And the hermit instructed them to go and shoot one wild goat, but don't attempt to take a second. And sure enough, they went, they found a wild goat, they brought it down with ease, and they thought, well, you know, that's easy, let's, let's ignore the second part of the advice. So the Saracen shot at the second goat and his bow snapped. But on the other hand, there are tales of the Desert Fathers putting to death serpents and crocodiles that insisted on terrorizing the local population or devastating their crops, including one that had just obediently ferried the redoubtable Abba Heli across a river. You know, that was something that it needed to do, but if it was going to terrorize the population, nevertheless, it had to go. So the restoration of Adamic authority over other creatures really does happen. And I think there's no doubt about that. But it's always going to be a highly localized phenomenon in this age. And when there is a conflict, the burden of trying to coexist with animals that are impervious to Adamic authority, that burden can't simply be shifted onto other people. On the other hand, the, the saints typically seem to recognize a measure of moral equivalency between the needs of humans and other creatures, and they're all expected to play fair. There's a story of St. Anthony the Great described as playfully catching one of the wild asses that were destroying his vegetable patch and saying, why do you hurt me when I do you no injury? He then commanded the herd to, in the, to go and graze elsewhere. That presumes that there is an elsewhere to graze that isn't somebody else's vegetable patch. You know, it's easier in the desert. And there are many similar stories, some Athenite from various places, in which the animals are instructed to come and ask for food if they need it, rather than raiding the kitchen garden. Non-human creatures also have their legitimate place and space, and we should be willing to accommodate them if at all possible. And our greater powers and skills give us a corresponding obligation to care for other creatures' welfare, to be among them as one who serves. Very striking Elder Basilios, who I mentioned, actually uses that passage for our relationship, human relationship with other creatures. So I want to end 
technology permitting, uh, with some images from monastic life. I, I particularly like this first one. Uh, it's a bit hard to see with, with the light up there. It, taking, taking hay to the sheep, because the, the image of the, uh, you know, c carrying the, the hay bale on her shoulders reminds me of the, the image of the good shepherd carrying the sheep. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the, this is uh, Solar Monastery in France and St. Gilles and the, the Fawn. St. St. Nectarius with the tree that he used to hug as a sapling and uh, by which he was buried. This is a monastery on Crete, new buildings at Chrysopihi, which was built under the direction of Elder Porphyrios. Uh, he was in Attica and was blind at the time, but that didn't stop him. He could see it anyway. Uh, and you can see you know, a modern building that looks as if it's growing out of the rock. And he said to the abbess, you, know, you mustn't put a high wall around it because the sisters should be able to see out and admire the forests and the sea. This is another eco-monastery in northern Greece right up in the forest near Mount Olympus and their fruit trees and their iconostasis uh, with the days of creation and you can see the whole thing on the, the boards over there. And we're going to end where we began with the cross on the face of the world. It's the St Andrew's cross in the granite filled with moss but that's all right, all crosses are orthodox. So thank you. Last was part of the format of the day to give a response to Elizabeth's uh, <coughs> fascinating and stimulating talk. Um, so I, I hope to talk for about, I don't know, five or ten minutes perhaps and then leave space for the rest of you uh, for questions, which I'm, I'm sure you'll have. Um, I always love working with somebody from a different discipline or a different perspective because there's always so much you can learn and it's so much more stimulating than staying within your own rut. So I'm not orthodox, I'm from an Anglican background uh, and my specialism is biblical studies. So... Um, there's a lot that's, that's in, in Elizabeth's perspective and his approach that's very different to my own, but nonetheless, I think there's quite a lot that could be complementary. What I'd like to do now, actually, is just to tease out some of the links I see between Elizabeth's insights uh, and further motifs and traditions from the Bible that echo, reinforce, or complement some of what she said. Um, now Elizabeth began by mentioning the tree of the cross, um, or the tree of paradise, in the context of God being at the centre of working salvation in the midst of the earth. To me, this speaks of temple theology, because the temple was understood as standing in the midst of the earth, as on philosophy of navel of the earth. And it was replete with the symbolism of foliage and verdant growth. If you read the description of the temple built under Solomon, a lot of the decoration was of you know, palm trees and pomegranates and you know, foliage and so on. Um, and the menorah, the seven-branched candlestick, it's often thought to be based on a, on a stylized tree. In Ezekiel's vision of the restored temple after the exile, and the, the temple being destroyed, he had the, the vision of the, the renewed temple. Here the water flows out from the temple door, from under the temple door. And he says, I saw on the bank of the river a great many trees on the one side and on the other. And these trees indicate the presence and work of God, the salvation of God, the blessing. But by the book of Revelation, the tree of life itself is directly featured in the vision of the renewed temple. Um, so Revelation 22 reads, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. So there you are, the tree of life, right there um, by the door of the temple. So in fact, Eden itself seems to be envisaged as assuming the nature of the temple. The precious stones there, for example, are like those on the priestly vestments. Um, and the rivers flow out to water the earth, just as they do from the temple, say in Ezekiel or in Revelation. Um, and I think that brings us on to another major life-giving and salvific aspect of this place in the midst of the earth, the river of life. 
which brings healing and life wherever it flows. It's a tangible expression of blessing. It's there in Eden, Ezekiel, Revelation. And even perhaps somewhere like Isaiah 8, um, there is a contrast between the waters of Shiloh, which the people of Jerusalem should have trusted, and the mighty river Assyria. The people of Jerusalem had, had got into a particular local conflict and called on the Assyrians for help instead of relying on God. Um, and the river there symbolises God's presence with his people. Um, and it's not for nothing at that point, Isaiah addresses the people as Emmanuel, God with us. Because God was with them, or would have been with them, if only they'd relied on him. Um, so Isaiah um, chapter 8 says, Because this people have refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently, and melt in fear before Rezin and the son of Remaliah, therefore the Lord is bringing up against them the mighty flood waters of the river, the king of Assyria and all his glory. It will rise above all its channels and overflow all its bank banks and sweep on into Judah as a flood, and pouring over it will reach up to the neck, and its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. So there's a real contrast there between the life-giving waters of God, effectively Jerusalem, the temple, um, and the kind of destructive waters of a foreign superpower that just you know, floods all the, the surrounding uh, regions. And of course, even on the cross, we have water coming out of Christ's side, and maybe that's another allusion to, to this water of life. So the experience of blessing and God's direct care of his creation through the provision of water is something I'll, I'll expand on, on later. Um, but it's just wonderful the way God works through this sort of material aspect of creation for his material creation. But at the same time, this water and, and verdant of growth speak profounding of, profound of blessing and the care and commitment of God. And there, the temple is a part of... Um, creation, life, redemption, salvation, um, this, this river flows uh, out into, into the world. And the physical and the spiritual can't be neatly separated. And I think those themes nicely expand on, on some of Elizabeth's observations about the cross. Um, a second theme which uh, Elizabeth highlighted is the incarnate word, um, and the logos being the inner principle determining the nature of something. Um, and a couple of ways I see that as relating to biblical tradition as well. Um, I suppose it's quite obvious when you look at Genesis 1 that it's one of the few places in the Bible where you can say, or we could draw a pretty direct Trinitarian theology out of that, because you've got the Father creating in the beginning. But he creates through his word, you know, let there be and there was, which reminds us of the incarnate word, Jesus Christ, and you have the Spirit of God above the waters. Um, but there's another sense in which the word of God is essential to the well-being of creation, as understood in the Old Testament anyway. Um, namely, that obedience to God's commandments by his people actually leads to blessing and well-being in all of creation, or sometimes more narrowly the land of Israel, as, as seen in some passages. But human and human well-being alike depends on obedience to God's word, God's commands. Um, so disobedience disrupts God's purposes for his creation uh, and leads to desiccation and suffering. Um, but on the other hand, obedience leads to life and flourishing. And I'll, I'll just read a couple of examples. So Hosea is a very good example to take because he has both the blessing aspect of this and, and the, the suffering. Uh, Hosea chapter 4 um, talks about God having an indictment against the inhabitants of the land. It says there's no faithfulness or loyalty and no knowledge of God in the land. Swearing, lying and murder and stealing and adultery break out. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. And if we talk about this as disobedience to the word, I think we can hear quite clearly echoes even of the Ten Commandments there with the you know, swearing, murder, stealing, adultery. It sounds pretty close to some of those very core commandments. And it follows on. Therefore the land mourns and all who live in it languish together with the wild animals and the birds of the air even the fish of the sea are perishing. And it seems to reverse the order of creation, because first you have the fish created, then um, the birds of the air, then the, the animals, and then humanity. And in this, it kind of winds back as everything progressively sort of disintegrates because of human sin and disobedience to, to the word. Um, so all categories of, of animal life are affected. But the, the circumstances giving rise to blessing are remarkably rooted in the verbal and the words too. Um, I'll just read out a, a brief couple of verses from Hosea chapter 2. It says, I'll make you on a, a covenant on that day with the wild animals, the birds of the air and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword and war from the land. 
and I will make you lie down in safety. On that day, I will answer, says the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow him for myself in the land. Um, so a covenant, obviously, is an agreement. It, it's, a, it's a verbal thing, ultimately. But then you've got the different elements of creation, creation answering each other, and God himself answering. There's this interplay of, of speech, I suppose. Um, so you've got peace, justice, heaven and earth, all the elements of creation working together in harmony for plenty. So the word, or the word of God and the law, lived out in people's lives, manifests itself in wholeness and well-being and creation. Uh, when the word is absent, people's lives deviate from the path set for them by God, and then creation mourns and suffers. So this fu- fully corresponds, I think, with Elizabeth's next point, that no creature is an island or part of the body of Christ. We function like members of a body, a community of creatures. Um, so the needfulness of humanity's response to God um, to enable the flourishing of our fellow creatures places a particular responsibility on us. Um, I don't want to go on too long because I'm probably eating up the time. Now I'll talk more later about um, the praise of creation for its maker, the revealing of the creator through creation, um, and how we can learn about the wisdom of God through the natural world. So I won't expand on any of those points now. Um, but I'd just like to note, finally, that um, the preachers aren't just God's servants in the sense that they praise God, but they also respond in obedience. And I think it happens so often and so consistently. We don't even see the response of, of all creation to God in obedience as a, as a kind of norm. Um, we, you know, we, we observe the interactions of humanity with God. In, um, I suppose we, we don't have to take for granted humanity's obedience to God because very often humanity disobeys. But in the natural world, it just seems to be a, a general obedience to, to God's um, purposes. So he speaks and separates the waters of creation. Um, he divides the Red Sea. He sends ravens to feed Elijah. He sends the rain where he wills, or whatever other natural phenomena. And Jesus' identity is revealed through the stilling of the storm. That's the point when people realise this is something that only God can do. But he speaks, and creation, the elements, obey him. Um, so there's an immediacy and a fullness of their response, which is so consistent it's easy to miss it uh, and take it for granted. Um, so God's not in the earthquake and the wind and the fire, or in the burning bush, or any other natural manifestations of his presence, but yet he's revealed through them. And their responsiveness uh, and participation in his action is, is something that pervades um, a lot of the Bible. One of my particular favourites is Psalm 29, God is is in the, the thunder, or Psalm 28 in the, in the Greek version. God manifested in the thunderstorm and the whirling winds, and it is his voice that thunders in the storm. Um, but, so he's not just there preserving creation or receiving praise from it, he's actually there acting in and through it and revealing himself through it and achieving his purposes. I think I'd better stop there, <laughs> but thank you very much for a really stimulating and interesting talk. <laughs>